before I read the scripture, would just like to take a moment to uh, thank Marsha for being our, our speaker this morning. As you know, Marsha Alexander is a longtime minister in the United Methodist Church, having served here in uh, Christian education back in the 1980s. We give thanks for her service at that time and for her continued service. She's served in missionary positions related to United Methodist Committee on Relief in uh, uh, Louisiana with our volunteer and missions in just across the border in Mexico. And as she has probably maybe the deepest longing of her heart uh, serving in the Philippines in uh, we give thanks for all that she has done, for her role and leadership in ministry there. And because of the long-standing relationship, it's really nice to have her here with us as a, a bit of a homecoming. And we give thanks for that. We also want you to know that as me, immediately after the service, there'll be a dinner in the Life Center. Uh, that'll be to honor her, and the contributions there will go to help support the ministry that she's currently a part of at Asbury College. And uh, we pray that you'd be generous, you'd share deeply, as you have in the ministry that she's been a part of for all these years. Hear these words from the Gospel of Luke coming from the 11th chapter, beginning at the 9th verse. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, would give them a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I look out upon this congregation, I see so many people that I know that have such meaning in my life. And I see so many people that I don't know that I'm very glad to see that are here and becoming a part of the family of God at Epworth Church. You've picked a very great church to be a part of. I want to thank Scott for sharing his pulpit with me this morning, and indeed it is a very great privilege for me to stand here and to report to you about the work that I do. You know, my journey began in the missionary work right here in 1989. Many of you were a part of that journey. And my journey has taken me many, many miles and many, many places in serving the Lord. And God has told you that I was at UMCOR Sager Brown, that I was in Mexico at our ministry of the Oklahoma Conference, and I had the privilege of being part of turning that ministry over to the Mexican Methodist Church. But God, in all of his wisdom, prepared me all along my journey in every step that I took to go back to the Philippines, which as most of you know, and I, I could never deny that, that was my heart's desire to serve in the Philippines. My journey was a long one. It's been a beautiful journey of serving God. I have learned so many things, and sometimes I've wondered, why will I need to know that? Why will I need to know how to construct a casita? Why will I need to know how to make uh, medicine and put it in a little bag and give it to someone who's at the clinic? Why will I need to know how to box up emergency relief goods? 
And God has shown me step by step that he was preparing all of that for me because truly I would need each of those skills and abilities that he gave me along the way to do now what I do. I just want to say thank you because all of you have been a part of that journey. You haven't been on that journey side by side with me physically, but you have been in my heart and you have been there to help to make things happen when things needed to be done for the sake of other people and to reach them for Jesus Christ. In 2009, I was still serving in Montes Juntas and we were beginning to hand the ministry over. In fact, in December, we were going to hand that ministry over to the Mexican church. But I decided that I would take a vacation with Lynn. I don't know if you remember her, but she was a young girl that lived with me for about 12 years. And she and I decided, she lives now in Washington State, she and I decided that we would take a little venture and we would go back to the Philippines to visit. When I got there and I walked into the Episcopal office, not knowing who the new bishop was, a young man came out the door and he said these words to me, Oh my goodness, Madam Marcia, I thought I'd never see you again. What do I need to do to get you back at Asbury? And I was startled because I didn't expect those words. The bishop was a young man who was, had been a chaplain in the military in Baguio City when I had been there before and served the church. So I knew him well. And I just looked at him and said, well, you can write a letter. Because I didn't know what else to say. I was so shocked at that invitation. Anyway, I said to him, you can't, you know, right now I'm still under appointment in Manas Juntas in Mexico. But by August of 2010, that appointment will be over, that three-year appointment, and I will probably be moved from Mexico because we're turning over the ministry. So I'll tell you what, I will tell you when to write that letter. I'll give you the go sign to write GBGM. Well, I didn't know what was going to happen next. When I did return from vacation and, and got back to Mexico, three days before Thanksgiving and about five days after I had arrived, I got a call from New York. And they said these words to me. First of all, the young lady that called was new on the staff. She said, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just, send, I'm just to deliver this message. And I said, well, what's, what's the message? And she said, you will be moved from Mexico in January of 2010. And so you need to be prepared to move. And I said, well, I don't think that's quite possible because in another three or four days, we're going to be having a big celebration and turning this ministry over. You know, I don't have time to pack my bags right yet. And she said, well, I'm just delivering the message. And so when I hung up the phone, I guess she thought I was going to be dismayed. I was very happy. And I sat at my computer and I typed Bishop Rudy Wan and said, you may do it now. And the response came back from him in the middle of his night. It's already done. <laughs> so you see, God works in mysterious ways to get us to where he needs us to serve. But if we are open to him, he will always direct our paths in the way that we need to go. And so with assurance, I knew that God was behind my return to the Philippines. I spent the next eight months, of course, preparing and doing itineration, which is what I'm doing now. And then I was on my way to the Philippines. I was appointed there as the missionary. And so in, I arrived there in September of 2010, and for the next few months, 
I served as the missionary. And then before the next annual conference, the bishop called me again and said, I'm going to appoint you as president. Is that all right with you? And I said, Bishop, if that's what you want to do, you are the one who appoints me. I will do whatever you tell me. And then an exciting journey did begin. Because Asbury College, as some of you know, is a little school. It's a United Methodist school. It's on the island of Anda. It's very far away from anything that some people call civilization. But we are growing and we are becoming civilized and we do have many things that we didn't have before. The school was in trouble. It was in trouble. It was not gaining any students. It was not growing. It was just remaining as it was. The one thing that had happened over the years, which had been my dream all along, Asbury College was not only a college and a high school as it had started out. It had an elementary school and it had a kindergarten. So now we have K, kindergarten, all the way through college, which had been my dream way back in 1976 when I first went there, that someday we would have all the levels of education. So today, Asbury College, and they're in school right now. School began when I left. They were two weeks into school for the elementary and high school, and the college students were just registering. We have grown. Over the last two years, our enrollment has grown by, in the college by almost 100 students every year. When I first went, we had in the college department 130 plus students. To date, and I don't know the figures after I left, but when I left, we had 480 college students. The last thing I did before I left the island was to find a building we could rent because we didn't have enough room for all those students. So we have 123 students in our elementary department, 335 students in our high school, and probably over 500 students now in our college department, making our student body over 1,000 students. So I know that God is working. He's working in the lives of many people. He's working in the lives of many students to prepare them. We have, in the college, we have three degree programs. We offer bachelors of arts in Christian education and English. And this year we are beginning to, uh, we've always trained our young pastors and even our DS is our graduate. We've always trained our young pastors in Christian education in our conference. But this year, we are beginning the program to train our own deaconesses. Now, for you, that doesn't mean a lot, but to us, that's a big step, because in Southeast Asia, there is one training school for deaconesses throughout Southeast Asia. That school is Harris Memorial College, which some of the UMW women may be familiar with. They train, and it's in Manila, they are the ones who train all the deaconesses and have for the last over 100 years. So this is a big, bold step for us to contest them. But we are going to, with the support of our annual conference and our bishop, we are going to train our own deaconesses in our own conference. And once they are trained, they will be sent out and commissioned to any part of the Philippines, anywhere they want to go. And so this is a big step for us. We are now training all of our Christian workers within our own conference. So it, it's a big job for us to undertake. But we know that, that the Lord has blessed us and he is behind us and that this program will grow and it will help our growing church in Asia a whole lot. We also have degrees in bachelors of elementary and bachelors of secondary. 
their teachers. Last year we had 18 graduate. And of the 18, 17 of them were in the teacher education program. All of them but one has a job this year. They graduated in March and in June they have a job. The one that didn't have a job was sick and in the hospital when all that was coming off and so hopefully by now he has a job also. Our teachers are and our graduates are in all of our schools in Anda, public and private, even the Roman Catholic private high school, their principal, is a graduate of Asbury College. Our mayor, our vice mayor, many of our officials in our island are graduates of our very own school. So we know that Asbury, which was established to be a beacon of light to bring Christ to Anda, we know that we are helping to make a difference in the lives of the people in our little island community. In our elementary school, I just want to share with you about some of our students. In our little preschool, actually, uh, we have many little kids who, and our students are still students who can't afford to go to school for many reasons mostly because the income of the family is not more than a hundred dollars a month and there could be six to eight children to feed and so they cannot afford to go to Asbury College but that's the desire of the parents because they know that the education is quality and they know that they are being taught about Christ and about Christianity and so they come and they want their children to enroll. Through the advance of the United Methodist Church, which you support in many different ways, we have our own advance number. This year we have 130 plus students from kindergarten through college who are able to go to school because people give to our advance special. 130 students Imagine that from kindergarten to college. Receive an education because people that have never seen them, but who are good Christian people who want to see that they have an opportunity to go to school, help in that way. There was a little girl who we call her our abandoned child. And she's seventh grade now. Years ago, when she was just little, she was abandoned by both of her parents, left in the marketplace, and some distant relatives of her found her and they took her in. But they were very poor also and they couldn't really afford anything but just to feed her and make sure that she had a place to stay. As she grew up, of course, she knew about Asbury. She heard kids talking about it. She heard them talking about it. She heard people in the market. She decided that she was going to Asbury. That was going to be her goal. She was going to go to Asbury. Through the advanced special, Jessica, which is her name, was able to come to Asbury to begin her, her education in general education. Now she's seventh grade. She's seventh grade. Truly, it's made a difference in her lives for people to be concerned. Another young man whose name is Miko was a junior in high school when I first met Miko. His mother had died leaving him with his father. When he became a junior in high school, his father announced to him, get out. I don't want to support you anymore. You're not welcome here. And if you go to school, you're on your own. Now he was 11th grade. He was ready to, to almost graduate. The high school principal brought him to me and he again received an, at, an advanced scholarship to go to school. When they are high school and college students, we call them our working students because we give them a small job to do so that they can help 
and have ownership of their scholarship that they're being given, and it's not just a handout. They know that they have a responsibility. He was given the job of cleaning all the toilets on campus. Imagine that, he's a junior in high school. He did that job faithfully for two years so that he could graduate. And by the way, his father took another wife, moved to Manila, and he never saw him again. He graduated last year, not at the top of his class, but he graduated. He walked proudly across that stage to receive his diploma, and I was just as proud to hand it to him. This year, he's working, and he enrolled himself in college. He's very ambitious, desires to be educated. Another young man who's in our college department, whose name is Muammar. Muammar is a math major. He's, at this present time, doing his student teaching in math, and he will graduate midterm, and hopefully he will become a faculty member very soon at Asbury to teach mathematics. Momar lived on the mainland of Luzon, and so he, he was away from his parents. He came to live with his brother-in-law, who promised that he would take care of his tuition. But then something happened, and he told him one day, I don't, I'm not going to do that anymore. Well, now students at Asbury are not going to come and say, I don't have any money to go to school, can you help me? They just won't do that, they're very shy. But the other students are, are very good about saying, this person needs help, that person needs help. So that's my network of connections of who needs to be helped. They came and said, Momar is dropping out of school. He's going to be a senior, but he's dropping out of college because he can't afford to go. They've cut off his funding. So he too was given a scholarship and given a job to do. And he's had many jobs to do. And he does them faithfully because he desires to have an education. I'm just saying all of this to you because I know that you are here and you never see them. You only hear stories when somebody comes and tells you of things that happen in the world. But we who serve are the ones who are blessed more than the ones that we serve because we see those who are struggling, those who are hungry, not only physically but spiritually, those who are in need in many ways, who feel desperate because they cannot figure out a way to rise above the situation that they've been put into. As someone said, it was the life lottery that they think they've been given. They want to rise above that, but oftentimes they don't know how. And so through things like the advance, through your prayers, you help those of us who are out there to be able to help people, to be able to help children who really need to be educated. And so many of the kids that I have been with along the years of serving at Asbury, they are now professionals. They serve in every profession that you can think of including our own district superintendent, our own past chairman of the board. They are everywhere serving. They are pastors in churches. They are lawyers. They are doctors. They have gone on to succeed. And they have done that because congregations and people like you have cared to be a part of a blessing for them to help them rise out of an oftentimes situation that they see no hope whatsoever. So hope is given them, and that's what it is about. The hope and the love of Jesus Christ as we share with them in our convocations, in our Bible studies that we have, in our campus ministry that we do. We give them that hope that Christ offers 
to a world that's very much in need. And they go on to be very successful. We couldn't do that without you. I couldn't be there without you. And it's not just a financial thing. The most important thing that congregations anywhere in the world can do is to pray. Pray for your missionary. Pray for that person by name. Pray for them every day. Because without that, we can do nothing. One of my students said to me before I was leaving, Ma'am, what did you do to make Asbury have so many students? Look at all these students we have now. They're everywhere. They were coming out the woodwork. It was amazing. Where did all these students come from? I didn't do anything except open my life to God to be used. And God used it in the way that he knew needed it to be. And I sat back and I marvel at the miracles every day that happened before my eyes with the students, with the faculty, all around me. And I just continue to ask God to use me, to give me the new skills, the new abilities that I need. Because every day is a different day. There's no normal routine day. Every day is a different day. And I want to close with this. Many years ago, when I first got on an airplane to go to the Philippines, I fell asleep on the plane. And when I woke up, the verse that came to my mind was this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know that verse. Very familiar. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. So from this platform where I knelt so many years ago, and a lot of pastors put their hands on my head and gave me that blessing to go forth. I have always trusted God to lead me down the path that he has seen. And the scripture that I read said, you ask, you knock, and you will receive. There's also another part of that. If you continue to trust and believe no matter what, oh, there have been hard times, there have been places when I felt like I was knocked down. But I just got up and dusted myself off and asked God to keep me going through sickness, through all kinds of things. And God has been there pulling me up, giving me skills and abilities and determination to go forward. And that's why I can stand here and tell you that I've come really full circle. I started at Asbury, and it was the desire of my heart always to serve that school. And now here I stand before you. What an amazing God we have.